Welcome back to this video series on creating your own STM32 or microcontroller based hardware designs in Altium Designer. In the previous videos, we looked at an overview of the project we're going to be creating, going through a block diagram and kind of our basic system requirements, then choosing parts, doing the switching regulator section, sizing the components, and also adding USB-C. In this video, we'll finally get to adding the microcontroller and doing the pinout, adding a crystal, decoupling capacitors, and so on. As usual, I'd strongly suggest you follow along and to help you do so, make sure to check out the link in the description below to get yourself an Altium Designer free trial. Let's get started. As you remember last time, we added this switching regulator section, including sizing the components and then adding this USB-C connection and importantly remembering these CC pull-down resistors at 5.1 kilo ohms each. This schematic at the moment doesn't look particularly nice. We haven't annotated anything and we'll do that all once we've finished our basic or overall schematic. For now, let's move on to the next page of the schematic, which is the microcontroller, which we added in the first video. Again, we're presented once we click on the top tab on our MCU section with a blank schematic page. And now we have to add our microcontroller. Here again is the product page for the microcontroller we're gonna be using in these series of videos. It's this STM32 microcontroller. It's one of the few ones that are available these days during the chip shortage, and it's a fairly simple package and quick for us to root and lay out. In addition, it's in this interesting QFM package, which will be more interesting for PCB design than, for example, one of these LQFP packages. We looked at the datasheet in the previous video, so we won't do that today. Instead, we'll add the part directly onto our schematic, and then I'll show you how to do a microcontroller pinout. So going back to Altium Designer, we're not going to create our own schematic symbols for this and our own footprints. We're going to use the manufacturer part search, which is a very handy feature to find footprints and symbols. If it isn't shown for you in the bottom right, you can click on panels and then manufacturer part search to pull this open. I've copied the name of the microcontroller and I'm just going to paste it in this search by the top and press enter. And we can see this manufacturer part search returns a couple of hits. And the first one here is of particular interest because it shows this green IC icon. And this means we can add this to our design. Altium 4 has pretty much has created the schematic symbol and the footprint. So the way we can add this into our design is simply right click, place, it'll download it from the internet, and then we can place our schematic symbol. Right click to cancel, of course, unless you want to place more than one part. If we zoom in, we can see all of the microcontroller pins. So remember, this is a fairly small package, 28 pins in total. Microcontrollers are fairly general use. So a lot of the times you can repurpose certain interface pins. For example, one could be I2C. Another time you might need SPI on those same pins or GPIOs. So we have a lot of flexible GPIO, and these are usually contained in banks. For SM32s, those banks are usually denoted by PA, PB, PC, BD, and so on. So we have this PA bank, which is fairly general. We have this PB bank, and we have various other pins. So our pinout connecting our SPI peripheral, connecting USB will be done on some of these A and B bank pins. And I'll show you in just a second how to do that. However, with any microcontroller, we also have other pins. These will be the power pins, which you apply power to. And typically for microcontrollers, you'll only need one power net, and that's typically 3.3 volts. And oftentimes you can run that as a lower voltage. We also have other pins. For example, this boot zero pin specific to STM microcontrollers is the boot mode or bootloader select pin. If we pull boot zero low, we essentially put the microcontroller into run mode. If we pull boot zero high, so to 3.3 volts in our case, and then reset the microcontroller, it puts it into bootloader mode, meaning we can flash this microcontroller not with a JTAG probe or CRI debug probe, but rather via USB or UART or something similar. So that's quite a handy feature. We also have the N reset pin, and the N in this case means inverted logic. So if we pull this N reset pin low, this performs an active or hardware reset of this device until we pull this pin high again. Now it turns out if you read the data sheet that this N reset pin actually contains about a 40 kilo ohm pull up. We also have PFO and PF1, which can be general purpose pins, but typically I like to connect an external crystal oscillator. For peripherals such as UART, this can be quite important to getting the timing right. So I typically, in most cases, provide an external crystal, and you have to do that at these PFO and PF1 pins, or as they're otherwise known, OSC in and oscillator out. At the bottom, as we spoke about before, we have VDD pins, which are positive power supply rail pins, so in our case, 3.3 volts, and we have a VSS pin, which is ground, in this case, be the ground or the exposed pad of the QFM package, and we'll see that later on when we get to routing. You can also see we have different types of VDD pins. We have IO2, VDD, and VDDA. 
And VDDIO, as the name suggests, is for the IO voltage. All these PA, PAB, and probably PFO pins will be running off the VDDIO voltage. So you can run them at a lower voltage, for example, to the VDD or to the core voltage. However, usually more importantly, is this VDDA voltage. A lot of these STM32 microcontrollers contain analog to digital converters, so ADCs, and these are fed with a filtered voltage VDDA. So we're going to perform again some slight filtering on this VDDA pin and not just connect up 3.3 volts directly. So that was a lot of talking. Let's start hooking stuff up. Let's start off with connecting the power and ground pins. Remember from our power page schematic with a buck regulator, we already added some power ports. We're going to be using ground, so I'll copy one of those and I'll copy the 3.3 volts over. So let me just cut those and move over to our microcontroller page and then paste them in. Ground, I'm just going to click and drag and move to the bottom. Control W for my wire tool and hook that up to the VSS pin and right click to cancel that command. VDDIO and VDD, I'm just going to tie to 3.3 volts pretty much directly. I can move my 3.3 volt power port space to rotate and hook it up something like this. Now we can't just hook up our 3.3 volt connections like this. It might run at slower speeds, but because of the switching speeds of microcontrollers and any switching devices, we always need to place decoupling capacitors fairly close to the power pins, or very close to the power pins rather. These act as, an, as a local energy storage in case the IC, when it switches, or lots of switches have at the same time, requires a large gulp of energy, so to speak. I'll copy over one of these 100 nanofarad 0603 capacitors and place it on the schematic. Ideally, you want one of these 100 nanofarad decoupling capacitors per pin. So we have two VDD pins, I've placed two decoupling capacitors. So let me just arrange this a bit neater. For example, something like this. Of course, the other side of the capacitor we have to attach to ground. So I'm just gonna copy my ground port, power port, place it down, and then route this up with wires once again. Right click to cancel my command. For the VDDA pin, we could, if we're not using the analog section, just add a 100 nanofarad decoupling capacitor and tie that to 3.3 volts. I'm just gonna show you if you are using this VDDA or the analog section, how we would filter that slightly. Normally ST recommends a 10 nanofarad capacitor in parallel with a 100 nanofarad capacitor right at the pin, but you can usually get away with just using a 100 nanofarad capacitor and then our ferret bead filtering network, which we saw from the power section. So what I can do, I can just click and drag and then copy this, something like this. This isn't the prettiest schematic connection and it's partially in the way the symbol is arranged, but this shows intent but this will do. Keep in mind, we haven't labeled VDDA yet, and you might be thinking, let's just place a net label, but I would place a power port in this case. So we can copy this 3.3 volt flag, space to rotate, I'll place it down on my VDDA section, double click on it and add an A to the end of the name. This way we have two distinct power nets, one for 3.3 volts and one for the derived 3.3 volt VDDA voltage. And this way we just have a very simple filtering again to feed this into the VDDA pin. Of course, this is just thrown down pretty quickly. You usually should spend more time designing your filters. I've designed these circuits many times before and I've never had a problem. Next, let's set this boot zero and these end reset pins. Now we're later gonna be exposing pins from serial wire debug, which is very similar to JTAG, which lets us program and debug one of these microcontrollers. And we'll see which pins we'll need to connect for that. Oftentimes, it's also very useful to connect the end reset pin to allow the debugger to perform a hardware reset in case something goes really wrong or before you're uploading a new program. So we're gonna be tying this end reset pin to a programming header. For boot zero, as I said before, select the boot load mode. And since in most cases, I usually just use the debugger to program and flash my firmware, I will pull boot zero low with a resistor. This can be 10K or less, or even tied to ground if you never want to use this boot zero pin. Now, in the name of bomb consolidation, I'm not gonna use a 10K resistor. I'm just gonna copy one of these, you know, fairly high value 5K1 resistors to make sure we're not introducing another unique part into our schematic or bill of materials. I'll copy that over, hook that up with a wire command, and on the other side, pull that low with a ground connection. Again, label the net, press P and N, and then tab and boot zero as a name. Right click to cancel. There we go, we've hooked up our boot zero connection, and remember you might want to attach this to a switch to pull it either high or low, depending on if you want to use the internal bootloader or not. The end reset connection, it's oftentimes quite helpful to place a small filtering capacitor on the end reset line just to avoid any or prevent any spurious resets. Again, I'll just be using a 100 nanofarad capacitor, tying that to ground as well, and then cooking that up to end reset. And I'll just place another net label, P and N, and call that end reset. Later on again, we'll see how to hook this up to the programming header. 
Before we get on to doing the actual pinout, let's look at these oscillator pins and how we can hook up an external crystal. Once again, looking at the data sheet for this microcontroller, we can go down and look at the first page even, and we see it supports a four to 32 megahertz crystal oscillator. So anything in this range is usually fine. Depending if you're using certain peripherals, you might wanna choose a multiple of frequencies you're gonna be needing, but typically anything like an eight, 16 or 24 megahertz crystal is fine for most of these applications. On the topic of crystal oscillators and the external circuitry, ST's application node AN2867 is very useful for designing or telling you about the external circuitry that's required for crystal oscillators. In this video, I'll just give you the very basics, but if you're interested, you're more than welcome to read this almost 60 page application note, which is in fact quite interesting. What we're gonna be looking at in particular is this microcontroller and external crystal oscillator connection as shown here. Essentially, the microcontroller internally contains part of the oscillator, so this is this inverted amplifier with a feedback resistor, and what we need to place are a crystal, two load capacitors either side, and an external feed resistor. And oftentimes, you can actually emit this external feed resistor. Without these load capacitors, however, oscillations won't start, and these load capacitors have to be chosen, first of all, depending on the crystal we choose and the crystal's load capacitance, as well as the stray capacitance associated with the wiring, pads, and so on. The feed resistor is there to limit the drive strength and to reduce overdriving the crystal, which in turn could lead to creating harmonics other than the fundamental. As we'll see, it's actually quite simple to choose these load capacitances. And for the feed resistor, I typically displace a zero ohm. And in case there's any trouble, we can always switch out this zero ohm resistor. So back in Altium Designer, in my library, I happen to have a 24 megahertz crystal. So I'm just gonna type in 24 megahertz in a certain package, and I'll just drag that in. As I said before, oftentimes we don't need this feed resistor, so I'm just gonna omit it for the sake of time in this example. Then what we'll have to do is take one part of the crystal, crystal's bidirectional, into one of these oscillator pins from the microcontroller, and then the other side into the other side of the pin. Let me just rearrange the text a tiny bit, and we still need to have these ground connections as well as attaching load capacitors. If we look at the description for this capacitor, we can see I've actually indicated that the load capacitance is seven picofarads. I've now indicated a very basic formula on the schematic, and that means the load capacitance of each individual load capacitor is simply the difference between the load capacitance given on the data sheet of crystal minus our approximated stray capacitance, and that number then times two. So our crystal capacitance or load capacitance in this case happens to be seven picofarads, and you can assume the stray capacitance is somewhere between you know, two to five picofarads. So if we say assume two or three picofarads, subtract that from seven, let's say that gives us five, we multiply that number by two and we get 10 picofarads. So our load capacitances either side should be around 10 picofarads. Hook them up like so, and then we are missing our ground connections. So I'm gonna copy a ground port and hook up all of these crystal connections. You might be wondering why this crystal has four connections, even though a crystal should only have two. Oftentimes they'll have ground connections as well. And this is a four pin package, which is very, very common for SMD crystal oscillators. So two for the actual crystal and two for ground. And we'll see that later when we come to routing as well. Okay, so now we have to do our pinout and then also add our JTAG or serial wire debug header. Now this process of selecting the pinout can either be done with the data sheet or application notes and will oftentimes vary a tiny bit between manufacturers, so Microchip, Texas Instruments, and STM32 Microcontroller, uh, just to name a few. A lot of programming environments and a lot of tools these days for microcontrollers contain capabilities that help us with selecting pinouts for us. Specifically for STM32 microcontrollers, we have STM32 Cube IDE. And this is not only a programming environment, which we can use for debugging, writing our code and so forth, but it also lets us do the pinout. So if you want to follow along, I'd strongly suggest just clicking on Get Software. This is free and it works on Windows and Mac and Linux. I already have STM32 Cube open and it's an Eclipse based program, so it should be fairly familiar to most. The way we can do our pinout is by creating a new project. So at the top left, click File, New, STM32 Project. You'll then be presented with this target selector. ST makes various dev boards or test boards, so you could select that dev board you might have or various examples, but we'll go to the microcontroller selector. And you can see there's this huge list of various microcontrollers, their prices, packages, flash and RAM size, and so on. But all we have to do is type in our part number. 
which I've copied over from Mouser. And we can see if we search for that, we get two different alternatives. Ours happens to be the first one up here. So click on that, press next, give it a project name, and we'll just do ADE STM32 tutorial pinout. Then we can just click finish because we're just going to be doing pinout planning. And we're presented with this top down view of our QFN microcontroller package. So we can zoom in a bit, and this is really neat because we can click on any pin, for example, let's say PB8. If we left click on that, we can see what this pin is capable of doing. So it could just be a GPIO input output, it could be a CAN RX line, it could be a timer channel and so on. So that's one way of doing your pinout. Another way is looking on the left side and seeing that we have these various tabs which are basically drop down menus. And we're gonna be using that to do our pinout predominantly. If we go to system core, then sys, I would like to enable debug serial wire. And this is the main way of programming and debugging these microcontrollers. We click on that, we see PA13 is serial wire debug input output, and PA14 is our serial wire debug clock. So these are two main signals. Compared to JTAG, you only need pretty much two of these signals plus power and ground for debugging to work. We also want to enable our crystal oscillator. So we go to RCC on the left hand side, high speed clock, choose crystal ceramic resonator. And that enables PFO and PF1, which we already hooked up on our schematic. We want USB, but we can see it's actually grayed out here. Nicely enough, Cube IDE tells us what to do. If we just hover over this, we can see we need to do some pin swapping. And all we have to do is go to the Sys tab from earlier and select this checkbox pins P1112 instead of PA910. There we go. And now USB is not grayed out anymore. Click on USB again and select device FS, which is full speed. And this enables the USB differential pair on pins PA11 and PA12. So in this way, we can continue and do the pinout, and then all we have to do is take this pinout and move it onto our schematic. So this is pretty easy. This will do for now, and in the next video, we'll then look at connecting peripherals where we'll select SPI and so forth. But for now, we're just gonna do the essentials of getting a microcontroller up and running. So let's transfer this pinout over to Altum Designer. So I have my pinout open on my other screen. I'll just place net labels. I can change the orientation with these arrows on the right side. And I have serial wire data IO, and that's PA13. I'll just place that over here. I have my serial wire clock. I'm always pressing tab to change the name and then enter, and that's PA14. I also have my differential pair of USB, and I have my crystal oscillator pins, which I also need to label. So OS in and OS out. From the previous videos, we in the power section had our USB-C connector because this is our main power input, so to speak. And we already assigned this differential pair here with a differential pair directive. So all we need to do is copy these global net labels or these ports, both of them together, control C to copy and copy them over to our other schematic page. And quite nicely enough, Altium Design also tells us where the other instance of these ports is. And these need to be connected to PA11 and PA12. So PA11 is D minus and PA12 is D plus. Something like this, and then Control W to hook up all of my wires. So we're almost ready. We just have to add a JTAG or serial wire debug header, which we then connect our debug probe to when we have the physical board in our hands. Best in 32 microcontrollers, you can see I have one of these ST-Link devices in my hand. These are probably around 10, 15 euros, so fairly inexpensive and you'd use those with a USB connection to then program and flash and upgrade and debug your device. What I do these days is use these Tag Connect probes, and these are basically pogo pin connectors and adapters. That means you don't have to solder on a physical header onto every board you produce with a microcontroller. So this will save space, time, and cost. And don't worry, this video isn't sponsored by Tag Connect, but it's just something I really think is very useful. So all we have to do then on the PCB, if we look at one of these pictures on the left side here, is just make a footprint with these pogo pin pads and we just press this Tag Connect probe on there and can debug and flash our device. Of course, this then also can lock in place with some clips. So instead of putting a head on our board, I'm gonna be putting this on our board. I happen to have already made a footprint with this and I'll choose the no leg variant. I've already made the schematic symbol so that I know what my pinout is. So I have to hook up serial wire data IO, the clock pins and reset ground and VCC. Optionally, for larger microcontrollers, there's also this pin six, which is the serial wire trace signal. And this can be very useful for live plotting of variables, but oftentimes it's not needed. So I'll just place that somewhere in the schematic, copy over my net names and place them and connect them up with the control W wire command. And reset line, and power and ground, and power happens to be 3.3 volts.
Now to indicate, because we'll be doing an electrical rules check later, that we are okay with leaving pin six floating, I do P to place, then go to directives, then generic no ERC marker. And that's what I'll typically do for pins that I leave floating. So click and right click to cancel. And later on, we'll then also do that for the unused microcontroller pins. Anything that interfaces to the outside world, including this JTAG or SuraWire debug connector or header, should it ideally be connected by ESD protection, as well as maybe some series resistors to enable current limiting when these pins might be shorted. For this very basic example and educational design, I'm going to be admitting this, but this is not considered good practice. So make sure for your commercial designs to include ESD protection and take care maybe more with filtering and so on. In our case, we're just trying to make a simple board that we can get up and running and that simply works functionally. In this video, we learned how to hook up a microcontroller, the very essential functions, so the crystal oscillator, serial wire debug connections, including a serial wire debug header, the boot mode select pin and reset pin, including its internal pull-up, as well as then using STM32 Cube IDE for STM32 microcontrollers to help us do our pin out, which we can then simply transfer to the schematic. In the next video of this series, we'll then be looking at how to connect our inertial measurement unit, the sensor we chose in the first few videos via SPI to our microcontroller. Again, with the help of SCM32 Cube IDE, selecting an SPI peripheral, and then also the external circuitry needed to get this sensor up and running. Thanks again for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.